History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 386th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I'm your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. Kelly, on this episode, we are doing a location over in the UK. It was suggested by Bob Sherfield, and that is Bishop's Stortford. And I think that's how you say it, Kelly. There was no pronunciation key on Google. So for you locals, I may have been saying that wrong, and I'm going to continue to say it wrong and... Kelly will too through this whole thing. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> so hopefully that's the right way to say it. Anyway, this is a little town that's over there in England and it has a lot of haunted locations we're going to be sharing with you. But before we get into that, we want to welcome into the crew Ed, Jacob, Brendan, Joe, who joined us on the Clay County Jail episode. And on our last episode, I welcomed Matthew, but so uncharacteristic of me, Kelly, I didn't point out that he has a very unusual spelling of his name. So I need to rectify that situation. It's spelled M-A-T-H-I-E-U. Right. I can't believe you didn't point that out because you always make a big deal about that. <laughs> I know. I must have been lacking sleep because of our investigation. I'll use that as my excuse. Well, I would imagine so. So, All right. Well, thanks for joining us and the crew, everybody. And now this moment, Noddity. The moment in oddity was suggested by Mary Bright and Memory Berkelow. The superstition of knocking on wood has very interesting origins. There is an ancient belief that hamadryads or dryads live inside trees. Hamadryads are creatures found in Greek mythology that live in trees. These nymphs are born bonded to a specific tree and will be with that tree until the tree dies. It was believed that the gods would punish people who harmed trees for this reason. The Dipnosophistes of Athenius list eight hamadryads who were the daughters of Oxalus and Hamadryas. And these were Caria, associated with walnut or hazelnut, Petlia, associated with elm, Ampelos, associated with vines, Balanos, associated with oak, Morea, associated with mulberry, Cronea, associated with dogwood, Ageros, associated with black poplar, and Psyche, associated with fig. The cracker butterfly is part of the genus Hamadryas, which is named for these nymphs. And it is fitting as this butterfly spends all of its time on trees, and its coloring causes it to completely blend into the tree. Ancient priests and priestesses would knock on trees to summon Hamadryads when they needed help. This could be help with getting rid of evil, or sometimes the dryads would fulfill wishes. Perhaps like rubbing a lamp to get three wishes from a genie? So if you knock on wood out of superstition, just know that you might be summoning a tree spirit. And that certainly is odd. Are you afraid of the dark? And now, this month in history. In the month of May, on the 16th in 1943, Royal Air Force Lancaster bombers hit Nazi German industry hard by destroying two huge dams in Operation Chastise. These bombers accomplished this feat by using bombs designed by Sir Barnes Neville Wallace, who was an English scientist and engineer. These bombs were called bouncing bombs, and what they did was bounce across water towards a target, and this bouncing action kept them from getting caught in torpedo nets and other obstacles. 
The bomb has backspin, which causes it to bounce on the water several times before dropping underwater and going off near the target. The official name for the particular bouncing bombs used during this raid was upkeep. The RAF bombers dropped the upkeep bombs close to the surface of the lake at the Moan and Edersee dams, flooding the Ruhr Valley. Two hydroelectric power stations were destroyed along with mines and factories. It would take months for the Nazis to get production back to normal. They tried to frame the attack as a minor inconvenience, but it boosted British morale, and had they used a thousand bombers, they would have had even more success. Sir Wallace was disappointed that there were not follow-up attacks to keep the dams from being repaired. Many of the buildings and homes in Bishop Stortford have changed very little since medieval and Tudor times. This is a historic market town in Hertfordshire, England, with a history dating back to Roman occupation and Norman conquest. Many locations claim to have ghosts from churches to pubs to hotels and so much more. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of Bishop's Stortford. Early on, the area where Bishop Stortford would be established was a small Roman settlement that was mostly used as a stop along a well-traveled road. After the Roman Empire fell, the Saxons moved into the area. The village would first be mentioned in the Doomsday Book of 1086 with the name Esterterford. This was named for the Stuarta family that built a manor here and ruled over the location. That manor was sold in 1060 to the Bishop of London, who was named William. Putting Bishop with Steorda gave the town the new name of Bishop Stortford. The nearby river would take on the name River Stort. The Normans would build Waitmore Castle shortly thereafter, but the castle would not survive as King John had it destroyed in 1208 and now only a mound remains, as this was one of those Mott and Bailey designed castles. And you remember how those are made, right, Kelly? So these are the ones where they would pile the dirt up until they made a big hill, and then they would build a fence around the base of it, and then they'd put the castle up on top of that mound. Ah, okay. So since they destroyed the castle, all that's left is that mound of dirt that they used to put the castle up on top of. There are many tunnels that seem to have run from the castle to various places in the town, and these were once open for historical tours until deemed unsafe. During medieval times, Bishop Stortford became a market town and remains that today. The corn exchange brought malting, which brought brewing, and the river canal was used to transport all kinds of goods from coal to timber to food supplies. Death was a common occurrence in the town. Three plagues swept through, starting with the bubonic plague in 1349, which killed half the town. This was followed in 1582 by the Black Death, and then the Great Plague of Blunden in 1665. Bishops Stortford managed to avoid most of the bombing raids of the World Wars, but there was a prisoner of war camp in the town. Fires have swept through, and there have been tragedies that all towns face. Many places in the town claim to have spirits, and the center of the town seems to be a hot spot. Let's explore a few of them. So this first spot that we're going to check out is St. Mary's Catholic School. One of the most famous ghosts in the village is the Grey Lady Ann Kelly. She's literally everywhere. I have never heard of a town having this one ghost that just shows up everywhere. The only thing I can think of is that we had some kind of gray dress that a lot of women fancied or something here, or I don't know. It's hard to believe that there would be this, this one gray lady that shows up in all these different places. She likes espresso. That could She's be. She's very caffeinated and she bops all over. That could be. This first stop is where many people believe she originates from, and the legend behind her is that she's a nun who jumped from an attic window after she was disgraced, but no one knows what that means. We would imagine if the story's true that she more than likely was pregnant. I would think that's how a nun would be the most disgraced. And it does make me wonder if they had gray habits, maybe, and that's why she appears as a gray lady. Could be. This originally was a convent founded by five nuns from Belgium in 1896 and is located at the top of Windhill on Bell's Lane. These nuns had a goal of establishing a school, but the people of the village were suspicious of the women and their unusual dress, which again makes me think that they were wearing something other than the traditional habits. They bought Windhill Lodge and carted all their belongings up the hill. I mean, literally in carts. 
<laughs> they started with nine pupils. This original building serves as administration offices today, and another building built later is the school, so it's still open today. Interestingly, even though the origins of the Grey Lady are traced to here, there are no stories of hauntings here, at least none that they're talking about. Uh huh. But that's so weird to me because I'm like, if you're tracing the Grey Lady back to this place, she's got to be making appearances or something. So I thought One that was would think. weird. St. Michael's Church is located at One Windhill and is at the center of the town. This is a beautiful church with many medieval touches that give it a castle-like look and it has a churchyard. The first priest in Bishop Stortford was John Day Strathern, and he arrived in 1332. The Normans built the first church here, which eventually fell into disrepair and was pulled down in the late 1330s. The 1400s would see this new church built in the perpendicular style of English Gothic, with lots of windows, and it was bigger than most parish churches. As we have covered on other episodes, Henry VIII began a war of sorts on the Roman Catholic Church and pronounced himself head of the Church of England. He sent Thomas Cromwell out to dissolve monasteries and bring the wealth that the Catholic Church had been accruing by buying up land and renting it out, back to the nobility. St. Michael's was used as barracks by Cromwell's men for a time. The church had to be fumigated after the men finally left. Yeah, there were articles about that, and I just found that so funny. I was like, I've never heard of a church saying, we have to fumigate because we had all these soldiers in here laying around on the pews. stinky men. (laughs) I'm like, how do you fumigate a wooden pew after a guy's been on it and sweating? I wonder if they had to take him out like, sand him and refinish him and stuff. I don't know. I just found that hilarious. The churchyard harbors spirits. People report seeing a mysterious figure in black And this has taken place for a couple centuries, all the way up to the mid-1980s. A woman was walking by the churchyard early one morning when she saw a woman wearing a long dress walking amongst the tombstones. She at first thought the woman was visiting the graveyard, until she disappeared. There was no description of the color of that dress, so I don't know if this was another one of our gray ladies or not. And interestingly, I hadn't thought about this, but when I was looking up the about for St. Michael's Church, usually a saint is a human. Michael is an archangel, so it's just unusual that they have sainted an archangel. Yeah. Next, we have the Boar's Head Inn, which, of course, makes the fine lunch meat that you and I love to eat. Is it related to that? (laughs) No. Oh, my mouth started to water a little bit. (laughs) But apparently they do have a boar's head mounted inside this pub, I guess. All right. But I was like, ooh, boar's head. I love that. The Boar's Head Inn is across from the church, located at number 30 on High Street. This was built in 1420, and when the church was transferred over to an Anglican church, Queen Elizabeth I ordered the rood loft to be taken down that had been built under her sister Mary's reign, because her sister Mary was a Catholic, and so she had transformed a lot of these churches and added all this stuff on. Well, Queen Elizabeth was the head of the Church of England, and so she was out to destroy everything that Mary had done when it came to the Catholic Church. Wood from this was used at the Boar's Head Inn, and a huge wooden beam that goes across the fireplace is one of those pieces. This building is thought to have been the church house for St. Michael's and used for the brewing of church ales. Oh, a brewery. You can imagine. Yes, I perked right up. I went, wait a minute. Does that mean that you could have beer at church? (laughs) But Kelly, now before we get into thinking that the church was getting into an early form of craft brewing... The term ales was used for any festive gathering or fundraising event. I had no idea. Ah, okay. So it wasn't happy hour before mass? (laughs) No, apparently not. (laughs) Okay. During a church ales, a warden would beg for or buy malts and then sell it to the public to raise funds for the church. So it kind of had a little something to do with the brewing. It was like, we're going to use the beer to make money for the church. It's kind of the way I interpret it, which I'm all for. The Boar's Head has records showing that it paid rent to the church, which makes sense because the church owned a ton of property here. As we just mentioned, Thomas Cromwell was going out to get all the money back because the church, the Catholic church was really smart. They usually were the center of town and everybody would come there and they started realizing how much money they could make off of owning all the land around them and then renting it out. But this is one of the early ways that they were making money. The pub was built in the Tudor style and features exposed timber framework. The inn has changed hands many times over the years and was almost destroyed in a fire in 1991. The Grey Lady is such a strong presence here that the pub has been exercised multiple times. There are those who say that she is harmless and that there are other malevolent entities here. During a Ouija board session, people felt that they communicated with the Grey Lady, and she told them that her name was Sarah and that she had been raped and murdered by the squire's son several centuries before. 
And the date that this occurred was the day of the seance. How convenient that it happened to be the exact same day that they were doing that. If you're using a Ouija board in a pub, not a good idea. I would say probably not. (laughs) You really don't want to have a lot of liquor in you before you're doing any kind of investigating or seances. You're opening yourself up to who knows what. A gray misty vapor has been seen in the pub, and an entire bar full of patrons witnessed the gray lady float through. I can imagine that was a hell of a thing. Other paranormal activities include chairs being dragged across the floor, trash cans in the back rattle on their own, loud bangs are heard on the doors, and a dog refused to go down into the cellar. A man is thought to haunt the cellar, but no one knows his identity. An apparition of a woman has been seen many times sitting at the bar. And Ruth Stratton, who wrote Haunted Hertfordshire, a ghostly gazetteer, claims that a ghost people call Captain is possibly Captain Winter, who had owned the Windhill House. So let's talk a little bit about this Windhill House. Captain Winter raised a band of yeomanry, and he gave permission for them to camp on the grounds of Windhill House. This was in the early 1800s when there was a fear that Napoleon might invade England. The captain decided to test the soldiers one night to see how alert they were, and this turned out to be a bad idea. One of the soldiers was so alarmed that he fired his musket and killed the captain. Whoopsie woo! Yeah, maybe you shouldn't surprise the guys in the middle of the night. The property is now business offices and occupied by Pelly solicitors. People have claimed to see the ghost of Captain Winter on this property too, so not just at the Boar's Head, but over here, as well as a phantom army marching around. The George Hotel is another place where the Grey Lady is seen. This hotel just recently came under new ownership and was also renovated. The George Hotel is thought to be the oldest inn in the town. The original foundation was built at the end of the 14th century, and Thomas Petworth may have been the first owner, as he was running it in 1417. I just love all these dates we're rattling off. I mean, these places are so old compared to here. Absolutely. The Hawkins family were the next owners, and they held on to it for 300 years. During the 15th century, they held their manorial courts here. The central location made it a prime spot for people to stay. King Charles I, quote, dined at E. George in 1629. This was such a big moment for the little town that the bells were rung at St. Michael's Church in honor of the occasion. King Charles II visited often because he loved the races at the New Market. And the George was the place he stayed with his entourage. William Layer of Cambridgeshire became the owner of the George after the Hawkins family. He leased the George to Thomas Doncaster and Philip Mills along with an adjacent barn. The barn was eventually demolished after 1800. Five cottages were added to the property And when the original building was expanded, these cottages became part of that, and the hotel was raised to three stories. So when you see it from the side, Kelly, you see like this normal, tall, three-story building, and then there's these five little roofed buildings that are like connected to it right behind it, and those were each separate cottages that they just put all together, I guess. Interesting. Yeah, so it has a really interesting look to it. It became the Bishop Stortford Excise Office and a terminus for stagecoaches coming from London. In the early 1800s, the hotel became a Masonic Lodge, followed by an auction house in the 19th and early 20th century. Today, it is a hotel sitting above a popular Italian restaurant called Prezzo. And as we said, this has just come under new ownership and it's being renovated and everything, which apparently also includes the website because you click on it and nothing is clickable, doesn't take you anywhere. So I don't think you can stay there yet. Oh, dear. (laughs) Guests and staff claim to have had strange experiences here from doors that open and close on their own, strange noises, beer taps and water taps that turn on by themselves, and the feeling of being watched. The Grey Lady is here and seems to like room 27 the best. Could it be because of the mysterious cupboard set into the wall? This is something that hasn't been open for reputedly 200 years. And the reason why is because the handle is stuck and no one wants to force it since the building is historically protected. According to Jenny Kemp's Haunted Bishops, Stortford, there are some who believe this opens onto a balcony where a murderer hid before jumping out of the cupboard and murdering a woman in the room. But we would think that a balcony would be visible from outside. And I didn't see any balconies anywhere, so I don't know. Maybe they have a different description of what a balcony is. I just thought that was weird because I'm like, how does it open onto a balcony, but you can't see it from the other side? Perhaps. The feeling in the room can be malevolent, and a gray mist is sometimes seen, which is why the gray lady is thought to be here. She has appeared to a few as a full-bodied apparition, usually standing over the bed with her arms raised. 
many guests have left this room in the middle of the night out of fear, including a military officer who felt safer sleeping in his car. And since we have a gray mist here and the gray lady, I don't know if that means that she might have been the woman who was murdered here. So again, another legend behind her, or we have multiple gray ladies floating around. And now a little break for a word about one of our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. Kelly, did you hear that HelloFresh has been named Newsweek's most trusted meal kit company of 2021? Four million households served. I did hear that. And you know what? I am not surprised. I'm not either. Not only is there a huge variety with 25 plus recipes that we can choose from each week, but the fresh ingredients are sourced directly from growers and delivered from the farm to our front door every single week. And it's 28% cheaper than shopping at the local grocery store and 72% cheaper than going to a restaurant. And I have absolutely been loving it. Kelly, this has turned us both into a couple of chefs and even Mort, too. I know. I was surprised that he took to it so well. He's gotten on the computer now when I'm going in each week. Well, which recipes would we like to have this week? And he's like pushing me aside and picking what he wants. The only thing that I did have to chastise him on is he was using his spade to try to stir the veggies the other day. A little bit gross. (laughs) Don't need any cemetery dirt in my food. But that adds fiber, Kelly. But the cool thing is those meals are made and on the table in like 30 minutes. I know. It's so quick and easy. If you want to join us in our journey here with becoming chefs through HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash Bump12 and use code Bump12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Bump12 and use code Bump12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. Kelly, I think we both can say we're We're haunted haunted by by the the great great taste of HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. This episode is sponsored by Laura Ruby and the book 13 Doorways, Wolves Behind Them All. Kelly, you got the audio book and you have finished it. I sure have. The ending was so... Wait, wait, wait. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. I was just going to say it was so satisfying. It was a really good ending. I loved this book. Oh, well, that's good to hear because I'm still close to the beginning because, well, you know, I love the paper and ink smell and I just have to have the book in my hand. So it takes me a little longer. This is a great book. It is inspired by a true story, which is Laura Ruby's mother-in-law. The star of this show is Frankie. And it goes back to 1941 in Chicago. Frankie is left in an orphanage by her father. Times were tough. A lot of parents did that back then. And her mother has died. And Frankie wants to know what happened. Years later, she goes out to try to find out what really happened to her mother. She wanted to know what other ghosts lurk in the shadows of her past. And how much would she be willing to risk to find out? You got to read the book to find out about all that. But there definitely are ghosts involved here, which is right up our alley here at History Goes Bump. The audiobook of 13 Doorways, Wolves Behind Them All, will be available at a special, deeply discounted price all through the month of May at your favorite digital audiobook retailer. And if you're not into audiobooks and you're more like me and need the paper and ink variety, that is now in paperback from Balzer and Bray, which is imprint of HarperCollins. Get Laura Ruby's 13 Doorways, Wolves Behind Them All. You'll be glad you did. The Star Inn pub probably dates back to at least 1636 and was a timber frame structure that is now covered with bricks. And a lot of what they did back then is cover these things over with bricks or plaster so that you couldn't see the timber frame stuff. But they look really cool when the timber shows. I like it. John Ward was the first owner and in 1808, a brewer named Hawks and Company took over. The small pub garden here was once a stable yard that became a car park and then finally the garden. Unexplained activity includes noises and knocking in the small bar of the Star Inn. The Grey Lady has also been seen here. A person cleaning the place ran into her and fled, never to return. So apparently it wasn't a nice experience. Right outside the pub, a male apparition has been seen walking three feet in the air. Interesting. I wonder if the ground used to be higher? What they think might be the case is that there might have been a bridge that went from one building to another, possibly across the street or something. And Ah. he's walking on that in a residual way. And that's what people are seeing. But the bridge isn't there. Sure. Just would be very weird to look up and be like, 
okay, there's a guy walking above my head. Well, kind of like the apparitions that have been seen at the Exchange Hotel. Yeah, the Exchange Hotel in Virginia that we investigated. They had that walkway that they believed went from the cookhouse over to the main house or to the hotel. And people have seen spirits walking across there, but it's raised. They're above where the ground level actually is. Very true. Across the road from the Star Inn pub is the Black Lion Inn, which was used for coffin storage during Tudor times. The Black Lion gets its name from the emblem of Edward III's wife, Queen Philippa, the daughter of the Count of Hainault, which was a province in Belgium. The word black was ominous in the life of Philippa. She was a victim of the Black Death in 1369, as was her daughter Joan. Her son Edward, Prince of Wales, was known as the Black Prince. Want to hear something a little synchronistic? Cure. So I was researching this and I had literally just gotten done writing this little paragraph about the Black Lion Inn and all the relations here to the black stuff. I was also watching Jeopardy. So for those of you who watched Jeopardy, you might remember that they had a category that was like they had the creature and then it was from black was the next category. So it was like they were trying to play on words from the creature from the Black Lagoon kind of thing because then they had legumes was the third thing. Black was the word that was to be in that second category part of the answer. And the question literally asked about Queen Philippa's son, the Prince of Wales, Edward, was known as, and I was like, Black Prince, because I had just written this paragraph. And I was like, (laughs) oh, my God, I got an answer to a Jeopardy question because I had just done the research for it. And I couldn't believe, I was like, oh, my God, the synchronicity all the time. Yep. Bishop Bonner held prisoners here that were accused of heresy. And these prisoners would cross the bridge from here to the bishop's courthouse for their hearing. Local builder Joseph Glasscock bought the Black Lion in 1899 and removed every inch of the plaster that covered over the interior timber work. The two-story building attached was once a stable. There are a couple of ghosts here. A ghost haunts room six and once joined a man in bed. There's also a mischievous little girl ghost dressed in Victorian clothing that has been seen and guests and employees have heard what they think are her footsteps. She likes to turn off the lights and hide people's keys. Cooper's Department Store. This is located across from the Black Lion Inn. This timber frame building is basically the Sears of Bishop Stortford. If there was still a Sears out there. (laughs) I think they went bankrupt and are gone, which is kind of sad considering that we grew up with the Sears Roebuck catalog I believe that they're still open as a web purchase. Oh, okay. I believe. I may be wrong. But hard to believe as kids we grew up in like Sears was the place to go and we loved getting that catalog and looking at the toy section. Oh my God. Residents can find everything for the garden, gifts, glassware, and tools. They also might find some ghosts because this is a very old building. The hanging judge Bishop Bonner's nephew owned the house that was once part of the building that houses the store. There is plaster ceiling decor that dates back to the early 16th century at the entrance of Cooper's giving a glimpse into its past. This store had been called Maslin's in the 1980s, and employees complained about poltergeist activity. There are thought to be three spirits here. An angry woman who is hostile, a male spirit in a brown uniform, and our gray lady, who is spotted as an apparition that disappears into walls. The angry ghost is blamed for throwing tools when the building was being renovated. She also gashed the fresh plaster, and there were reports that you could see the scratch marks there for quite some time, and then they covered them over. Human bones were discovered in a cupboard during the refurb, and it was thought that perhaps burying them would tamp down the hauntings, but that has not been the case. The Oxfam shop is another haunted shop in town. The basement is the most haunted location in the building, and a woman working there claims that she felt a tap on her shoulder, and when she turned around, no one was there. That seems tame, as do the stories of stock being moved around down in the basement. But the story of an ominous shadow figure on the stairway scares many people. Pearson's department store had been located at numbers 15 and 17 on North Street, and this was yet another favorite of the Grey Lady. A woman claimed to see her in the basement stock room as a grey misty figure. And yet another haunted shop is Tissamon's, which is a men's clothing store dating back to 1601. The building itself dates back as far as 1360, so Tissamon's claims to be the oldest men's clothing store in the world and had served the royal family. This was until it closed in 2013. Tissamon's had been something else at its start. They did more than dress the living. They dressed the dead. This was also the local undertaker and had been named Slater's. The great lady has been seen there on many occasions. 
Mr. Tissaman himself claimed to see the apparition multiple times, usually at night. There were also the claims of the smell of smoke in the building. And I found a couple of articles that were written there. A lot of people were really sad to see Tissamans go. The economy just had gone down so much that they just couldn't keep it open anymore. So you imagine this place had been open for hundreds of years and shut down. So sad. Yeah, just amazing. The Cock Inn dates back to 1540. There were four inns on this corner, and this is the only one that still remains, making it the oldest one here. The building is timber-framed with three gables and crooked windows. This became a tavern in 1620 under the name The Black Lion and was renamed Vernon's Head in 1749. And this was not the same as The Black Lion that we already talked about. The name was for Admiral Edward Vernon, who captured all the military installations at the port of Portobello in the West Indies in 1739. As a matter of fact, many pubs renamed themselves in his honor, so there was a bunch of Vernon's Head everywhere. That was right after the event. It took the cock in 10 years before they did that. So everybody else did it, like, right at the moment. The coxswain's like 10 years later. I wonder if we should name it for that guy. (laughs) (laughs) A little slow on the uptake. The pub eventually took on its current name. This inn was the place for the average person. The rich and noble stayed elsewhere, while the cock inn was for servants and employees. Funny thing, the more elite crown inn or red lion inn that were on this corner no longer exist. So the one that stayed was the (laughs) low budget one, I guess. The notorious highwayman, Dick Turpin, stayed here in between bouts of robbing wealthy travelers along the nearby road. Wanted posters at the time read, Wanted, known highwayman and rogue Dick Turpin. The robbery and grievous offense upon travelers on ye London to Cambridge coach. He had been espised in company at ye Cock Inn. So it even said on the wanted posters where he could find him. Ironically, on the south side of the building, there was a courthouse and jail. Coal merchants moved in, and there was a shop here until the 1960s when it was demolished to make room for more road. The publican's daughter was playing in the cellar one day when it suddenly became very cold around her. The cellar door then banged shut loudly and locked itself, leaving the poor girl locked in the cellar. She screamed for a bit before she was finally heard and rescued. The culprit is said to be a mischievous little girl ghost named Emily. Strange lights have been seen, as well as shadow figures, and a man in Civil War clothing has also been seen. And that, of course, is not our blue and the gray from over here. That's the Civil War there. A young female ghost is seen crying, and people believe she is waiting for her husband's return. Renovations in the 1970s escalated the haunting activity, and employees would come in to find tables overturned, lamps broken, and the energy in the place began to feel malevolent. The bad energy seemed to leave when they started decorating with beautiful, fresh flowers and vases everywhere. So I don't know if evil spirits don't like pretty flowers. Or perhaps they saw it as an appeasement. Something. You're trashing the place with all this refurb you're doing. Well, look, we have pretty flowers now. Okay. (laughs) I'm fine now. You can take out that wall as long as I got some daisies to look at. The police station opened in 1940 at Bass Bow Lane across from St. Michael's Church. Supernatural activity started to be reported in the 1970s. Two officers were hanging out in the cell block and enjoying good conversation as they'd been told that there were no prisoners in any of the cells. So it's like, "Ah, we just have to hang out, play cards, do whatever. Their easy evening ended at 3 a.m. when they both jumped at the very loud slamming of a cell door. They both jumped up and ran to the cells and found cell door number two vibrating as though it had just slammed. There was no one anywhere in the cell block. Magistrate's court is in this building, too. A few weeks after this incident, an officer called two of his colleagues to return back to the station from a call that they were out on because he felt that there were intruders in the courtroom that was above where he was sitting. There had been a crash and some bangs, which led him to believe there were multiple people. The group went up to the courtroom and looked through the window and saw that all the tables and chairs had been turned over. All the doors were locked. There was no one in the building. They could not figure out how the furniture got that way other than that something unseen had done it. And not only are these police seeing this, but it's the police station and courthouse. So many police officers claim to hear disembodied footsteps and doors lock and unlock themselves. Two police officers were playing cards one night when they heard footsteps coming down the back stairs. They turned to see who was coming, but no one ever showed up. A female officer had similar experiences when manning the front desk. She started thinking that some of the male officers were playing tricks on her. So she would hide behind something to jump out, and she would wait, and wait, and no one ever appeared. I'm going to get those jerks. And she's like, (laughs) where did they go? (laughs) And probably the strangest story occurred during a refurbishment. The constable noted that the lights had been left on in the men's and women's bathrooms. 
He tried to go into them to turn off the lights, and they were both locked. He talked to the contractors the next morning to make sure they turned the lights off when they were done with their work. The men looked confused and took the constable into the bathrooms to show him that the lights had bare wires that had no power and were not hooked up. What has caused this place to be named the most haunted police station in England? It was built on a former slum property where much suffering probably happened. So that's the way they explain all the activity going on here so much so that uh, this is apparently the most haunted police station. The gray lady was said to pop up at a cottage on Bow Lane and a gray mass has been seen at Bow Lane Car Park. A white lady passes across from an old cemetery on the east side of Cemetery Road to the new cemetery. The disembodied sounds of horses and carriages are heard in various places. Sometimes the coaches are seen riding along the lanes in a spectral form. The shrieking lady runs along Water Lane. The mound that was once Waitmore Castle has given up its literal skeletons, mainly of children and babies, leading many to believe a hospital was once in the castle. Prisoners were kept in the dungeon. The energy is malevolent near the mound. Some even think the Grey Lady had actually been burned at the stake here. That's just a few of the things. There is so much activity going on in this town. It's amazing. Maybe a good place for a future investigation, or two, or three, or four. <laughs> <laughs> if we ever get over to England. Most interactions with the Grey Lady have been negative in nature. But sometimes she's not in a bad mood, which makes people wonder if there's more than one Grey Lady. Is there even a Grey Lady? Are these locations in Bishop's Stortford haunted? That is for for you to decide. decide. Lots of great stuff to check out there. We encourage you guys to check out our website at historyghostbump.com. And if you want to send us some feedback, you can do that at historyghostbump at gmail.com or at all of our various places in social media, whether it's YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that. Do you have an email to share from Selena? She said, hi, I just watched your podcast on the 100th Meridian. I was born and raised in Dodge City. And for people who want to know what episode that is, it's actually the 100th episode because that's why we did the 100th Meridian. (laughs) I thought it was kind of cute to do that. I lived in a house at 313 Kirk Street, and I think it was a portal as I encountered several different ghosts. They moved things, threw things, and a few times seemed to bump into you. I also worked at a collection agency downtown, and there was definitely a ghost in the basement there. There were tunnels linking buildings and sound could be heard coming from there. And once I was sifting through files, the light shut off on me and scared the crap out of me. Yikes. And most of these cities, downtown areas, had tunnels running through them. We found out on so many ghost tours. And a lot of it was just for ease of movement. Some of it was to move the upper crust to some of the more lower areas to do some naughty things. Goodness knows what. (laughs) (laughs) So it was to hide them from doing that kind of stuff. Thanks for sharing that with us, Selena. And I also wanted to point out uh, our listener, John, had written us to say, you know, when we're doing some of our investigations, that there might be times that we're using more slang kind of terminology or things that are more modern that people might not understand that are from another era. We hadn't really thought about that because sometimes we think about we have to explain the tech to them because they don't know what that is, but we don't think about the fact that we're using some verbiage they might not get. Although at the jail, we were getting some slang like yo and stuff like that. So (laughs) yeah, but that was the first time I think we've ever experienced that. Yeah, it's kind of like when I was watching one of the Ghost Hunter episodes years ago, I think they were at a location that had a lot of German people that would have been there and they weren't getting a lot of interaction. And then they brought in a woman who spoke German or something. And so she was translating their questions and I, speaking I do German. Remember that, yeah. And they actually started getting activity then because they had somebody who could communicate with the spirits there. So sometimes we forget that we might be in an area that they don't understand the language, whether it's the actual English or whatever language you're using there or the slang or something like that. So I was like, oh, thanks. That's a great point. We'll have to think about that in the future. We want to thank you guys for joining us on this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to thank Brian Jones for increasing your support. We're going to be moving you under an obelisk tombstone. Thank you so much for supporting History Goes Bump. We really couldn't produce this show without you. This episode is brought to you by HelloFresh and Laura Ruby and the book 13 Doorways, Wolves Behind Them All. Want to keep the spooks away? Give us a review.
Sir Wallace was disappointed that Sir Wallace was disappointed that there were not <sighs> Sir Wall. <laughs> <sighs> The first paragraph already kicked my booty, so <laughs> it suits that it's doing the same to you. Sir Wallace was disappointed that there were not follow-up attacks to keep the dams from being repaired. Bum, 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 ba bum, 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 bum. Fokker, you can't say bomb in an airport. <laughs> from Meet the Parents. I couldn't stop thinking about that. I had no idea there were bouncing bombs. That's insane. I didn't either. That's why I pulled this one up, because I was like, well, the outcome wasn't all that great for Britain, but... I'd never heard of bouncing bombs. What an invention. <laughs> and when you watch the diagrams where it shows it happening, literally they're like boing, boing, boing three <laughs> times above the water. And then they dip down near the wall or whatever. And boom. That's like skipping a rock. That's crazy. Yeah. I'd never heard of them before. So very cool. And now. <clears throat> and now. <laughs> Many of the buildings and homes in Bisi- Bisip's. Here we go. <laughs> Strap in. Get that seatbelt on. <laughs> Which was used for coffin storage during Tudor time. Tudor. 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 That's a new kind of uh, era, I think. <laughs> Grief. 